Hi, my name is Logan Schwartz and I'm working with Group 5, we're covering chapters 9 and 10, and I specifically am going to be talking about Savant Syndrome, which is found at the end of chapter 9. So I wanted to begin this just by um, comparing Ramachandran's definition of what Savant Syndrome is to the National Institutes of Health, which is just a little bit more specific. Um, but Ramachandran defines it as persons whose mental capacity or general intelligence is incredibly low, yet still have islands of astonishing talents, where the NIH says that Savant syndrome is a rare but extraordinary condition in which, in which persons with serious mental disabilities, including autistic disorder, have some island of genius which stands in contrast to the overall handicapped. Um, and so some of the possible explanations for the disease itself, I've categorized it into two groups, one's more historically oriented and the other is a more modern hypothesis. And so in terms of historically oriented, we have um, Charles Darwin and his partner in crime, Alfred Russell Wallace, and even though these two men were researching long before the traits um, of savant syndrome were categorized and documented, they did comment on this idea of superhuman intelligence in their studies. And they differed though because Darwin said that evolution and natural selection is the only reason for these advanced human traits, whereas Wallace said that evolution is only valid to a certain extent and that God is the one who actually determines um, brain capacity and mental development. And the reason why this is important is because this is the segue into my segment because chapter nine discusses temporal of epilepsy and religious experience. So this is kind of how he introduces Savant syndrome. But then you also have a more modern hypothesis which Ramachandran discusses and it states that the explanation may lie in a region of the brain that's called the angular gyrus, which is found in the parietal cortex. And in theory, um, it goes that Larger left angular gyrus would mean you have more mathematically gifted savants, whereas larger right angular gyrus, you have more artistically gifted savants. And even though this is just a theory, we do know that damage to the right and left parietal cortex affects these corresponding attributes. Um, he also believes that some right brain regions may be enlarged at the expense of others, which could um, which could explain the lack of social skills, low IQ, um, et cetera. And so another thing that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to make a point to the class about was the misconceptions regarding geniusness and how that relates to savants. And so I just wanted to start with the Webster's Dictionary definition of geniuses, which states that a genius is a very smart or talented person, a person who has a level of talent or intelligence that is very rare or remarkable. And Ramachandran actually denies this and rejects it altogether and says that genius is not synonymous with superhuman intelligence and that a genius should be categorized as extraordinary talented, extraordinarily talented in a specific domain or domains, but quite ordinary otherwise. And so the reason this is important in comparing the two is what distinguishes genius geniuses from savants besides general intelligence and social skills is that savants lack the gift of creativity. So savants have the ability to replicate but not create in the way that Ramachandran defines this as a savant will, ne will never be the next Picasso. And so both occurrences are incredibly rare, geniuses just basically being from lucky genetic combinations that are rare themselves, and then savants due to rare brain formation that happens during development. Um, and so the next section that I want to go into that I want to mainly focus on are current studies that are being done about savant syndrome. And so there are a couple different sects that I want to talk about. One of them is actually media analysis. The film Rain Man is incredibly prominent in terms of educating the American public on savant syndrome. And so Daryl Treffer, who was the psychiatric consultant on site, actually is the pioneer of a lot of research that I'm going to be talking about, who um, also has really delved into media analysis. And so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is linkage to autism. And so I have this broken down into two sects of children and adults. And I'm gonna start with adults because that's a little bit more of an outlier. But they found in a study that was done two to three years ago that some of the symptoms for schizophrenia and adult autism spectrum disorder are actually incredibly the same in terms of cognitive abilities and social skills, not necessarily so much the diagnostic criteria like visual hallucinations and um, delusions and whatnot. And then the other sect I have is in regards to children and seeing if we can prove that there's a link between savant syndrome and children. And so 
They had a study of around 48 kids with mental disorders ranging from um, mental retardation to autism spectrum disorder to highly functioning uh, autism. And what they found was that savant attributes were the most common in autistic children. And so I found that really interesting and something that I saw recurring in my research that autism and savant syndrome are really related. So I wanted to stress that. And then the other kind of category that I want to talk on is how there have been movements to categorize and document savant syndrome in terms of individuals themselves. So Trevor and his partner have actually been compiling lists of research and individual case studies, even from the early 70s, into this mega report. And even though that's not going to be the one that I'm talking about, it's really important to bring up because it helped influence the study that I am going to discuss, which has to do with um, being born with savant syndrome or having it be an acquired savant syndrome, which basically means that there was damage to the central nervous system, um, degeneration of the dendro the central nervous system, or there was a stroke or something along those lines, which um, enabled them to acquire this disease. And he basically found that he took a survey of around 319 subjects and found that 90% of them were born with it, and the other 10% were acquired. And he did a similar study as well to the one done in 2014 regarding the linkage to autism and uh, savant syndrome and so what he did was he took an analysis of around 297 people I believe with various um, mental illnesses same as the earlier ones before yet in an adult population it got really similar findings that said that 40 to 45 percent of them were due to autism and that a really shocking 5 to 10 percent which he hypothesized was going to be much lower was actually due to not otherwise specified central nervous disease or um, some sort of stroke or damage to that specifically. And so to conclude, I do want to talk about more of the neurophysiological side of things simply because of this class and I'm very interested in it. But unfortunately it was kind of frustrating because there's barely any research in terms of brain scans on this. And so the most recent one that I found, Shuffert was one of the ones who was cited as working on this. and. It was done in 2012, and what they found was that individuals with savant syndrome typically have enlarged right cerebral hemispheres, which includes the amygdala, the caudate nuclei, and fiber track bundle volume. And so, as interesting as this was, unfortunately that was one of the only brain scans that I could find besides a one minute long YouTube video that wasn't incredibly credible. So. Um, I decided to leave that out, but more research is definitely needed um, in this field. But